Okay, so you may have noticed I'm not in Carbondale. I'm, I'm actually off in Elgin, Texas, where I wind up once a month and uh, coming from a, coming to you from the Holiday Inn Express in Elgin, Texas. Uh, that's why we have the beautiful background here, which is uh, the nunnery of Jetsuma Tenzin Palm, Dongu Gatso Ling Stupa there in the background. Looks a little better than the hotel room behind me, I think. All right, well, we are, I think, doing pretty well, hopefully. You think so as well, working our way through this text. I took a step back from the text, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot, obviously, big, big volumes, and we've got lots of volumes to go through. And... Uh, thinking, you know, what are the parts that are going to be really meaningful for us as we engage in our lives and integrate some of these uh, practices into our lives? And how does that wisdom really affect our lives? So I'm going to just really try to narrow in on certain parts. Some of it gets um, great detail and, and um, you know, I think we've covered a lot of it in many ways. Having said that, uh, I think the next uh, step as I was going through the sections uh, will be this section, and I'll pop up here, which is the true origins of dukkha. So we've been going through the four attributes of each of the four uh, noble truths. And uh, as I read even the last four, uh, it, it was very similar to the origins, uh, the, the attributes of cessation, true cessation. So I think most of us probably being humans, having this body and having our lives, uh, really want to establish a way of being that can eliminate suffering and help us live lives that are seeing some real progress in terms of ease of suffering, progress and freedom of how we get to live, progress in uh, reducing afflictions, having more resiliency and joy and so forth. So understanding origins of dukkha is, is really going to be critical, dukkha being this conditioned existence that we have, that we experience. Uh, We've talked about it many times, there's these layers of it, but I think this presentation right here is pretty uh, pretty helpful. So I thought, let's get into that, understand these origins of uh, suffering that gives rise to all these afflictions. And I think there's some really good advice as to how to approach afflictions. But big picture, uh, we have struggles being human. We have struggles living in our conditioned samsaric existence. There's obvious ones, aging, sickness, death, uh, the tragedies that we see around us. There's more subtle forms of suffering. Uh, there's a lot of suffering that goes on that we, we really struggle with in a sense of we, we don't think it should be, right? That's not fair. This shouldn't have happened. Why this happened to me? We forget, you know, that life is a very messy place. And then, you know, we somehow think we can make it not messy. And we struggle and create a lot of suffering there. And so even when we're doing well, we're doing well, we're, we're at peace and ease. Nothing to worry about, nothing to stress over, nothing to be anxious about. That doesn't last. 
suddenly there's something to worry about, something, you know, that gets some anxiety, something to stress about. Or even desire, you know. Hey, they have cheap homes in Italy. You can move there. Pretty nice. Yeah, how about that? Buy a home for a few euros, as long as you promise to fix it up. And you can live on this nice seaside community in Sicily. Sounds pretty good. Even if we're not thinking about moving there, suddenly we start thinking about, wow, what would it be like to be in a little seaside community in Italy looking at the Mediterranean Ocean? Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and all of a sudden, you know, we're lacking. You know, we're missing something. And so really understanding this this is is just key that um that the Buddha wanted to understand is it necessary? And he found it was not. And then that's the whole point is we don't need to suffer. We don't need to struggle like this. Dukkha is unnecessary. And so that's what we spoke about last week was the cessation, the liberation. So if we understand its origins a little bit better and some methods to work with the afflictions. And afflictions is anything taking us away from our well-being, our peace, our ease. Well, then I think, you know, very useful. So that's where we're at, true origins. I'll pop that back up again. True origins of dukkha. We live amidst true dukkha. Sorry, I had to move a little pop-up and it came up. We live amidst true dukkha day in and day out. It is our close companion, never letting us be peaceful in our own hearts or with others. Since we do not like dukkha and want to be free from it, we must seek out its causes, examine whether they can be eliminated, and if so, learn the path to do so. The Buddha identified afflictions and karma as true origins of dukkha. Karma arises from afflictions, the chief of which is ignorance, right? Misperception, misunderstanding of ourselves and our experience. In this chapter, we will examine the defilements that are the origins of dukkha, these Mental factors keep us bound in cyclic existence and prevent our attainment of nirvana and awakening. Buddhist psychology is profound and reveals parts of our minds that we may... <clears throat> Sorry, let me try that again. Buddhist psychology is profound and reveals parts of our minds that we may have been oblivious to. Virtuous and variable mental factors were described in chapter three in a previous volume, The Foundations of the Buddhist Practice. So we, yeah, we talked about that. The following afflictive mental factors are explained in the context of factors that produce dukkha and interfere with attaining liberation and full awakening. It's important to approach the topic of afflictions with the correct attitude. Avoid using various lists of defilements to criticize yourself, thinking, I have so much anger. I'm so jealous. Uh, what a bad person I am. Remember <clears throat> that gaining knowledge about mental defilements gives us the power to free ourselves from them and arrive at a state of true peace. So this is really so important that as we understand afflictions and defilements of our minds and our experiences, you know, the wrong approach is criticizing ourselves. And it's gonna give us some opportunity here to, to see how we should think about this. We have the potential to do this. Chapters 12 and 14 will discuss the possibility to attain 
liberation and our Buddha nature that makes that possible. Describing afflictions is similar to identifying the thieves in our house who have been masquerading as our friends, while all the time stealing our happiness. When we know their characteristics, we catch them, evict them, and lock the door behind them so they can never return. But unlike living thieves who can regroup later, once evicted, Afflictions vanish completely. So this is really key to start thinking about uh, how sneaky some of our habits are, some of the things we do that give us maybe momentary pleasures, but really undermine our incredible potential in this lifetime. Lots of habits and tendencies we might have. They look like friends. Uh, good for you, and uh, wind up actually robbing you of, you know, all of your potential. The really wonderful point here is once we see them for what they are, once we evict them, once we have outed them, we can actually lock the door behind them. These afflictions and the seeds of them are born of misperception, misunderstanding, ignorance. It's, it's put here. It's the word they used. No ignorance, no affliction. So we can actually start to recognize truth about causes of suffering, truth about how I exist, truth about things. And you know, one simple example that I give all the time that you probably never get tired of is, uh, you know, there's no such thing as an annoying person. Right? And uh, once we actually see that, once you expose that, it's hard to believe that there is one again. And so, as we've talked about many times, annoyance is in me, not them. They're triggering something in me. I'm annoyed. I think they should be different or I'm in a bad way. I would like someone to be different or whatever the thing is. You know, but that's me, not them. Annoying's here, not there. And if you start really uh, recognizing that in your life and start noticing if you attend to that person differently, they're not so annoying. If I start recognizing them, you know, just like me as well, another human being just trying to do what they're trying to do from their, their perspective, and they're just as valuable as I am, and we're all stuck in samsara, and we all have this, this disease of misunderstanding. And I start to understand annoyances, you know, from my seat of affliction, not, it's not in them. They're triggering something to me. Well, then I recognize if I change the seed or this belief about what is annoying or what they should be doing or what I would like to be different, I can see it cease. I can see that annoyance fade away. Well, I do this enough. Then what happens like today, I just don't find people annoying, you know? It doesn't mean I don't feel annoyance. I just no longer have the perception there's the a cause of it. I recognize immediately, well, John, you might want to redirect your <laughs> attention to something a little more reality-based uh, and then thinking someone should be different than they are. And then I correct you much quicker. So it's like that, and it's that way with many things. As we start to gain some wisdom, uh, some of those seeds of afflictions, well, there's nothing there anymore. So uh, it, it's like um, discovering gravity. You know, once you know it's gravity, you're not going to think there isn't. It, it changes things with wisdom. But to uh, hear this, isn't going to to do enough, you know, do that. 
to the degree I just talked about. We need to examine, is this true? Is it not true? Is this afflicted state uh, something that is temporary? Is it permanent? Is it me? Is it them? And start observing what happens when I'm around knowing people. So one of the jobs they gave me early on was to go hang out with them, spend time with people I find annoying. Watch what happens, you know. And yeah, I discovered there was a whole lot of me in this. And uh, so doing that, you know, for, for a long time, I got a different understanding. And once I have that framework in my mind, the other framework's not there anymore. I mean, I don't think any of you can convince me there's an annoying person in the world. It just doesn't make sense to me anymore. It does not compute. Do I get annoyed? Yeah, that makes sense to me. <laughs> I feel that. So, uh, but very rarely compared to how I used to be. Right? It's, 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 it's much, much more rare than it once was. So there's not much to trigger it once the framework shifts. So that affliction in my life has reduced significantly. Um. So it's like that, what they're mentioning here is as we start to look at afflictions, it's not that we're bad people, right? like I'm judgmental, like I'm a judgmental person, that's why they're annoying. It's much more, oh, I'm recognizing these afflicted states, which has given me an opportunity to work on them instead of, you know, wow, how can you be so judgmental, John? And that's not going to help. And we're going to go a little deeper and recognize that that affliction that arises is really not intrinsically real, independent from its own side. And so there's really nothing to pin on you anyway about criticizing yourself. So I'll go on to, to that. But I hope we're getting the point that as you embark upon this journey of noting true causes of happiness, true causes of suffering. As we see them more clearly, understand them more clearly, they lessen and the actual seeds of the misperceptions become eliminated, evicted. Seeds of our afflictions become eliminated. And there's just fewer of them. And in this process, you know, they, they, uh, it's not like they come back if we shine the light of wisdom on them consistently and long enough. That's We talked a bit about that last time, that's saturating our mind uh, with this. And uh, we don't have to achieve shamatha to reduce afflictions. So we don't have to achieve shamatha to actually remove some afflictions. We do have to have more of that stability to you know fully realize our Buddha nature. But there's a lot of things like this, like that simple exercise. If you did that long enough, you would find it pretty hard to find an annoying person. Because they just there's no such thing. So uh, is there a such thing as a jackalope? Carla, is there a jackalope? Come on. Uh, it depends on the perceiver. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and get back to the, the deal here. So, this other point that they're making is, you know, uh, they look like friends. But uh, there really are enemies. And there's so many things that we do that give us a short-term, you know, feeling. Uh, it could even be righteousness or it could be pleasure. You know, things that uh, we get some perceived benefit from, but they're actually robbing us of our happiness and 
And it's not always like good, distractive, pleasurable habits, right? So there's a lot of attachments that we have and activities and habits that give us, a, you know, a little pleasure and um, and could be hard to shake because they feel good. But there's also ones that don't feel good that we still can hang on to. And one of them I'm thinking of is um, resentment. You know, a lot of people will hang on to a resentment and uh, feel very justified in that resentment. And I'm never going to forgive that person, right? They don't deserve my forgiveness. And so people can be very uh, caught up as uh, this is a good thing. This is, you know, this is the way it's fair. This is just. But who's suffering? You know, I'm suffering. I have the resentment. I have the anger. I have the wound that won't heal. And so it's this example of something I think is good, but it's robbing me of my happiness. And, you know, people will say things like that. I'll never forgive them as long as I live, which you know, is basically saying I'm going to suffer for as long as I live. I'm the only one hurting here, you know, and I'm not uh, allowing myself to heal. So it's something that people hang on to. Looks like uh, it's serving a, this, this purpose, but it's actually robbing you of your happiness, right? So it's not just the pleasurable, you know, habits and things that we do that we're attached to or even maybe addicted to that are robbing us that seem very friendly. You know, and it's also these uh, sometimes challenging feelings and emotions. A lot of times it's, you know, even uh, the idea of um, success and desiring, you know, this kind of lifestyle or that kind of thing, right? It looks like it's my friend. And then um, look at all the discontent I have by not having it or hoping to have it or getting close to having it or even having it. And then it, I'm comparing it to somebody else who has more or something different. Uh, you know, even um, I always get a little bit fascinated on planes and, uh, you know, fly a lot, it seems like. And, you know, just the idea of, well, you've been bumped up to first class. So now you have a first class seat. You know, people, oh, first class seat. And uh, and then, you know, the next flight, they don't have a first class seat. You know, and then there's this kind of, wow, I used to have a first class. Well, look at those people, you know. And, um, you know, and, and we're just not a seat in a plane. You know what I mean? It, it's, uh, um, it's just fascinating how, uh, and some people pay quite a bit um, more, and I'm not, you know, judging what people pay, but because it, it's uncomfortable to sit in another seat when you're used to traveling a certain way. And, um, you know, let alone a middle seat, heaven forbid, that's like the hell realm or something. And, uh, you know, my God, I have to sit in a middle seat. And, you know, but if you didn't have any of that and you got a flight and you get to go somewhere, you don't care what seat you're in, you know, and you're just sitting in a chair and, you know, with other human beings on a plane. And, uh, and yet that whole thing about just sitting in a seat, you know, on an airplane, going somewhere with a bunch of people, there's whole social stratospheres of the first class and then the premier economy. And then those people have labor. Yeah, those people in the exit row. Wow, look at that labor. And, um, you know, and, you know, it's just this whole thing. On, and we're all just people, you know, sitting in a seat for a few hours and, you know, they got movies, you know. Uh, you might even chat with the person next to you. I don't know. The lady next to me had no interest in chatting on the way over here, by the way. Um, I always just give them a shot, kind of give them a little eye contact. They want to talk, don't want to talk. No. Okay. Um, and then we're human beings going somewhere. 
but there can be a lot of suffering. <laughs> you know, just and and even seed envy or whatever that is uh, that goes on. And we're just going on a plane. This stuff happens on subtle levels throughout our days, you know, all the time. And uh, and so there's lots of ways that these afflictive states can be robbing us of our happiness instead of just being grateful to, to catch a flight, get to me somewhere, you know, all in one piece, land, and uh, enjoy the pretzels. Yeah. Okay, so we get the idea then that a lot of these things that, you know, we kind of attach to that we get connected with or things can be very subtle, but instead of actually providing us what we're seeking, joy, liberation, so they're robbing us, they're masquerading. And uh, as our friends, sometimes it's, it's tough feelings, sometimes pleasurable feelings. Uh, sometimes it's these really subtle things, you know, like like that. Yeah. All right, let's see. Okay, one more example of that. So sometimes, like, I would ask for a tomato juice on a plane. It's my thing. I tell them tomato juice. And you know, I tell them tomato juice, no ice. And then you know what happens is they usually just give you the can. Ah, I don't get a little cheesy cup, man. I get a whole can of tomato juice. And, uh, you know, nowadays they pretty easily give the can because it's it's an odd thing. They're not going to be pouring it. Everything's tomato juice, pretty good. Uh, you can actually technically these days generally just ask for a can, they'll give it to you. But for a long time, some people give me a can and other people just give me a little cup full. Now that's kind of disappointing, isn't it? That's really disappointing. You know, I didn't get a whole can. That's how sneaky some things can be, right? Instead of just being grateful that you got some tomato juice. It's like, you know, well, usually they give me the can. You know, now I don't get it. Just little ways like that, very subtle things can, can uh, provide some discontent. Okay, I'll try to resist another airplane story, but we'll see. Uh, all right, so once evicted afflictions vanish completely, like all other... <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at myself. Like all other phenomena, mental defilements are empty of inherent existence. They're transient, like bubbles that quickly burst. They have no essence, like the trunk of a... <laughs> Does anyone know the difference between a plant plantain tree and a banana tree? Anybody know that? They look very similar. It's plantain. Plantain, thank you. Uh, yeah, I won't get in the whole distinctions, but I looked it up, went through it. If you're curious, you should as well. Looks like a banana tree, but they're different. But uh, the essence, like the trunk, uh, yeah, it's pretty empty. Rather than think of anger or any other affliction as a solid emotion, that is always lurking under the surface of your mind, ready to explode, spewing its vitriol. Recognize that it exists by being merely designated. Independence on some moments of mind that share common characteristics. We designate anger. In other words, there's not this big anger that's there uh, with us all the time. It's not a part of who we are. You know, it's, you know, a lot of people, you know, I've you know, I got all these anger issues. I have to work with my anger. And they have ownership of it. 
but if I start to recognize that it's really uh, manifesting in combination with other mental, mental factors and it's triggered in certain ways and it'll be arising sometimes, not arising other times. There's nothing fixed about it. There's nothing independent about it. It's not you. And this is a good way to start to, to see our afflictions that they're arising in dependence upon these conditions and these mental factors and my way of being and my so forth. And it's arising temporarily and then fading and then fading. You know, it is not this big anger thing. It's just waiting to come up. Uh, there's a whole composite of, of factors and conditions that pop up. And of course, some people, it happens a lot more than others. And those underlying factors um, are creating the conditions for anger to ripen. Uh, but it's not like those afflictions are us. And they're very impermanent and transitory. They're empty, right? Of, of independent existence. And so if I understand that, then I don't need to carry the big label of being an angry person. It's not a, let's see, it's not a monster that is an inherent part of us. It is not who we are. We need to view our afflictions from two perspectives. On one hand, they are the source of our misery. On the other hand, they lack essence and can be completely eradicated from our mind streams. There are many ways to classify mental defilements. We will begin with six root afflictions, the most prominent group in the Sanskrit tradition. So we, we love our lists, okay? Uh, three root poisons, but six primary afflictions. And then those six afflictions branch out. You'll find this three root in the, in the six. It's helpful to understand the, the, the deepest ones that give rise to the others. And so a list of six is a lot easier than 84,000. And uh, probably more, more uh, productive. And the idea is if we work on the root, we don't have to always you know, be struggling with all the ones that come from the root. But most important is to remember that none of these afflictions are part of your ultimate nature. They're not part of your nature. They're not intrinsic in you. And uh, they can be removed. They're the analogies they, they use so often are things like, you know, they're the clouds in the sky, but you're the sky, right? Clouds come and go. It's, it's not the sky. As we remove our afflictions, our Buddha nature is there. It's unharmed. It's, it's unharmed. There's, there's, there's nothing damaging. These afflictions get removed and our Buddha nature is pure. And you're already pure. It's already there. You know, it's just obscured like clouds in the sky. And I think that's just a very different way of understanding ourselves. I think it's really important to engage in these teachings and understand with a different starting point, which is that you're okay already. And that these are things that arise that show us you know, what our work is to do in this lifetime, right? This is pointing out what we get to work on. What's holding us back? And so they're, they're great uh, helpers, much like Carla's cat. And, uh, you know, jumping on her head there. It's been, it was great during the meditation. So the uh, afflictions arise and they point out, wow, here's, here's, something that we get to work on. And if we didn't have it, you know, we wouldn't know what to do. So uh, I get to make an appointment 
maybe I'll get a chance tomorrow to have a physical, go to the doctor, have a physical. He's going to you know, run a test, poke me around, do stuff. Maybe I'll get to wear that cool gown. I don't know. We'll see. And, uh, you know, but they're going to poke around, see what's wrong. Uh, but I don't have a particular pain in my body. I don't have anything I'm aware of. And so, but they might find something that, you know, I'm unaware, of, right? A blood test or something. We need, uh, you know, this pain in my leg to let me know, okay, I need to attend to this shortness of breath, okay? There's something I'll need to attend to. So I know, you know, to go see a doctor, I know to take a treatment. With our mental and emotional states, these afflictions, you know, it, it's pointing us to what we need to do to be healthy and well. It's letting us know what to attend to. You know, you go to the doctor and you are hurting, he's going to ask, where does it hurt? <laughs> oh, it hurts here. Okay, let's take a look at what's going on. Likewise, uh, our life can seem pretty, pretty, you know, Okay, and I'm not noticing these afflictions because they can be pretty subtle and I'm just used to it. You know, I'm used to having some anxiety when I speak in public or I'm used to having, um, you know, a little fear in this type of a situation. Or I'm used to stressing over a deadline. Get used to it. You know, it's part of life. I didn't have deadlines when getting done, you know. And, you know, we just get used to things and uh, they don't even seem like afflictions. You know, they just seem like, well, part of life. And so now and then we get these signs that pop up and they're stronger than normal and they knock us out for a little bit off our kilter. And it's and it's like, oh, okay, you know, here's uh, the work to be done that I didn't know about. You know, I like to always mention the Mark Maloney talked with Matthew Ricard, you know. Uh, Mark Maloney is a, one of the co-founders with, with Laura and myself and our, our other uh, business, the Mind for Life program, and he's from Australia. And Matthew Ricard's known as the happiest, one of the happiest men in the world. He's a Buddhist monk, real amazing uh, being, and uh, the real deal. And Mark sat down to have a little chat with him. And you know, Matthew said, so how's your loving kindness practice? Yeah. Mark said, oh, it's going quite well. And Matthew Ricard said, how's it going with the people you don't like? <laughs> yeah. And suddenly Mark had a guy to work on. Yeah. There is this guy. And so much of our life is like that, and it's sneaky and it's subtle. And so we don't want to fall into the trap of being like, I need to be perfect. I shouldn't be annoyed. You know, I shouldn't get so angry. I shouldn't be nervous so much. I shouldn't have anxiety. And, you know, start listing these afflictions. Or I shouldn't be so attached, so greedy, so selfish, um, self-centered. First off, you're none of those things. Those things are arising from time to time in your experience. Identifying how they arise allows us to work on the process of er eradicating the causes for them. And for me, that's this really just pithy, spot-on way that His Holiness of Working Don Lama and Tudin Chodin are, are trying to tell us to look at this. That um, these afflictions that arise um, arise because of, you know, causes and conditions and they're not who we are. And because they arise, if we notice them properly, uh, we can work on eliminating them. But it's not helpful to identify with them. And it's not helpful to uh, give them more energy than they than than they have already. 
it's a much more of a journey of noticing, understanding, and taking action in a positive way. And knowing that you're already okay, that these are not who you are, they're not part of your nature. They're temporary expressions of your experience. And there's patterns and habits that are creating them. If I change those patterns and habits and bring a little more wisdom to them, we'll experience them less. Right. So we're not impatient people. We are people who experience impatience sometimes. Right. I'm not an angry person. I'm a person who experiences anger sometimes. I'm not a selfish person. I'm a person who can be experiencing selfishness sometimes when they don't give me my tomato juice can and give me that little cup. You know, just, uh, or that would be self-cherishing, not selfish. Yeah. Uh, so, but we identify with those things. And that is another affliction. I'm identifying with those states of being as though that's who I am instead of recognizing them as aspects of experience I'm having. And the opportunity here is to start altering the conditions that give rise to them, start understanding the mechanism with wisdom. And then they don't need to arise so much or at all. So I'll pause right there. I'm going to shift to gallery view so I can see everybody. I always only see six people. Okay. Uh, so any thoughts, questions, curiosities, insights, airplane jokes, metaphors? Uh, Kurt or Keith there? Oh, it's me this time. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I've heard this a lot in the last three years or so, you know, the, the few baby steps I've taken on this path. What I'm thinking about listening to you this time is, is what, what in the heck's underneath that? Right. I mean, it, when I start looking at it, it seems like every, every single thing I do is, is, can be categorized as either an attachment or a de, or an aversion. <laughs> I mean, it, this question is coming up for me more and more. It's like, okay, well, what what's left when you get rid of all that stuff? <laughs> How about appreciation and acceptance? <laughs> okay, yeah, that okay. would be awesome. So, difference between appreciation and attachment. And the difference between aversion and acceptance. Contentment. Or... Contentment. Kate just whispered <laughs> contentment in my ear. That would be in the middle of those two extremes. I just, it's just almost impossible for me to imagine such a state. So I'll just keep trying. <laughs> so. How about... Uh, practice of just cultivating contentment. That's a primary practice in our tradition. Instead of cultivating desire, let's cultivate contentment, you know, which starts with gratitude, appreciation yeah. for life. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm seeing this more and more in my life. My, I mean, I don't, you know, my life is, my, my, my approach to life is changing significantly. Things that I know a year ago would have, would have caused a, you know, firestorm in my brain don't cause firestorms anymore. So I think I'm, you know, approaching this stuff. It just seems like it's an endless task. And yeah, I man, I guess that's okay. What else am I going to do? Right. I got countless eons here. So anyway, thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and don't forget to give yourself credit as how much less affliction you have, how much more at peace you are. Like it is happening. Yeah. Uh, John? Yeah. So, um, I, well, one comment is I think it's kind of useful to have tasks that are endless because 
we ever arrive there, then we don't know what to do. Um, but um, you, you were talking at the beginning about being in India and you know electricity only going on for half a day or, or brown apps or whatever. And, and I was thinking of things like you know clean water, indoor plumbing, you know hygienic, safe food to eat, and you know and kind of like how at least in my life at this period of my life I'm kind of removed from you know seeing death in my outside world. I mean, someone dies, they, they go away. We live in a pretty sanitized life. And I think that in itself can lead to suffering. You know, it's like if we're out in the wilderness, you know, any food tastes good and we have gratitude for it. We don't really, you know, care for it. Or, you know, you, you know, having toilet paper can be, you know, or, you know, you don't have toothpaste, we suffer, but, you know, if we're used to not having toothpaste and we don't, we don't suffer. We, we tend to bring all these things into our life to, to make our life easier, but at the moment they're gone, they cause suffering. You know, like I have, you know, instead of being grateful that, that I have clean water, I have to drink water that actually tastes really good and pure. If it has a little bit of a taste, then I'll complain about it rather than just like, hey, I'm grateful that this water is wet. So I, I'm just noticing that, you know, some level of sanitation can lead to kind of minute suffering. It's like, you know, it's like, get over it. You know, we got enough, we should be grateful that we have enough calories, we have clean water, we have, you know, we have we have electricity, or even if we don't, you know, I have a roof over my head. My head. So I think, you know, like the, we talked a little bit about, you know, or when the monks were here, they were, they were talking about, you know, only having two sets of robes um, and, you know, a cup and a spoon, you don't have to, you don't spend so much time worrying about all your stuff because you don't have stuff to worry about. So just a thought. Yeah, those are all great examples. And it's amazing how quickly we forget that the lives we have today are lives we once only dreamed of. You know, we aspire to live in a certain way and then we live this way and then right, we take it for granted or if it changes, like you said. And, uh, yeah, it's really good to have toilet paper when you're out in the wilderness. It's like, man. But 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 if you don't have it, then it's, it's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. When you don't have it, this becomes like wow. Then when you do have it, it's not two ply. What are you trying to give me something that's not two ply? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really good points, Chris. Really good. Carla. Sorry about the distractions. For the record, that's not even my cat. Um, so, uh, three <laughs> weeks ago or so, uh, when we were talking about similar topic, I, I think the text mentioned karma and klesha are both causes and conditions for dukkha. And I thought I had kind of gotten the causes and conditions definitions nailed by causes being sort of internal uh, and conditions being external. So I'm kind of wondering if I didn't quite understand that or how both uh, karma and klesha can be a cause and a condition. Yeah, they can play either role at different times. Um, because they, they seem both, they both seem to be like causes to me. Like if I were to just asked to define which one of those that you know which bucket to put those in i would say they're both causes but they can also be conditions okay that's where i might need a little bit of explanation i didn't clear it up for you no. <laughs> <laughs> so um my afflicted state of frustration right um can provide conditions for other afflictions or me to act in negative karma, right? So let's just let's just do karma and clash. Uh, out of an afflicted state, I'm creating karma, right? It's right, cause, and then uh, but the conditions I'm creating as well in that mental state uh, are conditions where other uh, events or activities can can happen. And so when you think about primary cause, primary cause is always going to be 
misperception. It's always going to be ignorance. So the, the root cause of everything is going to, to be that misperception. Then I'm going to have other misperceptions out of that misperception. I'm going to create karma. Now, the karma I'm living in is also going to be a condition in which I perceive the world in particular ways. Uh, but but they're out of that karma, my sort of habitual way of acting um, can create a ripe condition for me to become more jealous or desirous. But that's because of my karma is in a particular way or my setting and my karma isn't just my karma. My karma is my environment, the people I live with, the environment I live in, the United States and so forth. And so uh, these conditions will trigger um, these seeds of affliction, jealousy, anger, resentment, and so forth. And likewise, when I'm in an afflicted state, um, I'm going to start creating more karma. So you can think of that as a cause, but you also have the conditions around that of um, my attitudes and my perceptions. And so now I'm creating ripe conditions, waking up with resentment and frustration that's going to create certain karmas and karmas already there before my affliction. So they start, it's kind of, changing positions and they're very intertwined everything that we're experiencing is a result of our sort of habits and karma and then my attitudes and afflictions arise from those and then out of those i start creating karma and you know so they just keep changing positions and you know but very simultaneously um and the conditions I'm I'm in and how I perceive people, you know, is, is also going to be both karma and affliction. For example, if I'm perceiving someone in a particular way through my lens of karma, they're this kind of person, they're that kind of, they're my friend, not friend, something I like or don't like. I'm already in a, you know, perceiving someone in my karma, but if I have a frustrated attitude, now I have affliction with that karma. Now they're both interacting in how I'm going to act out on this person or not. But the uh, karma of how I see them, but the afflicted state that I'm in, or of being maybe frustrated or angry, and even though it's my friend, you know, I lose my temper. Uh, so they're, they're very much these intertwined things that are always, you know, you're not going to do anything. Our, our karma is pretty much how we're perceiving ourselves, our world, our experience. This lens, our habits, our conditioning, then the afflictions based on the attitudes and the things I'm seeing, the way I see them. So they're going to just reverse or, you know, play off each other. Uh, root cause, if you, you know, to make it... Uh, yeah, there's always misperception gives rise to both. But yeah, so they'll just intermingle and it's hard to identify which one would be a true cause of me yelling at someone. You know, is that really going to be my afflicted state or is it going to be my habitual pattern karmically? Which both go together. That's one answer I have. There might be from a Geshe who's much more qualified, give you a very definitive box to put those in. Um, but when we see how quickly uh, our attitudes, our afflictions, our states of being are, you know, come and go based on our conditioning and uh, our karmic habituation, you know, for me, it's pretty hard to separate them you know they, they, uh, they have an interplay so i don't want to get lost in the minutiae here john but you yeah. said karmic karmic habituation you talk so that we can our our habits can be a result of karma 
our habits are, are pretty much karma. So karmically, you think of karma in many ways, but one is you create the karma to, you know, the, the habituated tendencies of doing things. So um, if I, you know, any habit I have and I do it a lot, I'm going to have a tendency to do it more. I'm creating a habit. I'm creating conditioning. So karma is cause and result. You know, what's the cause, you know? Um, well, I mean, we can look at addiction since you work with addiction is, you know, if I, you know, take this drug and I get this effect, and I take this drug and I get this effect, take this drug. Now I have an addiction, you know, karmically, I keep creating the karma for that. And so karma uh, uh, is cause and result, and but also karma is our our actual conditioning. So the body I'm in, the way I perceive myself, the way I perceive you, is always through my lens of karma that I've created. Whether uh, so, so then you know I have strawberries or let's say tomato juice since I use that. And I like tomato juice. I'm creating a sort of karmic tendency to you know want some more tomato juice. When I get on a plane, by the way, last plane trip did not ask for any tomato juice. I was so, back so the karma can be like we can consider like a karmic event or a karmic ripening can be like on a cellular level, like developing diabetes or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, pretty much, yeah. yeah everything in your experience is karmically created, and uh, yeah. So uh, disease, cellular level stuff. Uh, the body that we have is a result of karma and it will change. Our health can change also based on, on karma. Yeah. It's not just the dog's name. It has many purposes. And, uh, but it's literally the, the conditioning of, of our experience. Uh, and so karma and klesha are that which obscures our actual vision, our, our realization of our Buddha nature. So I know there's there's some newer people here and some of you have been around a while. Exa I'll give an example. You who have been around a while, I apologize in advance. Okay. <laughs> Our Brussels sprouts delicious. I find them delicious. Our Brussels sprouts delicious. All about perception. Yeah, some people have a. It's not just perception; it's karma too. Some people, if you put a Brussels sprout in their mouth, will make a face and go, "Ooh, what the heck am I worrying? You know, this is horrible." I have a Brussels sprout, same bowl, same everything. I have a pleasurable experience. I have the karma to have a pleasurable experience when this Brussels sprout hits me. Someone else has the karma to have a very different experience. Same Brussels sprout, same everything. So literally, whether we like something or don't like something, we find it pleasant or unpleasant, uh, you know, we think it's in the Brussels sprout. But if I my karma changes, you might find out the Brussels sprouts truly are delicious. I get some roasted ones, got some recipes for you. Uh, and you might also have karma where that changes, or some people are allergic to strawberries, right? Other people, it's a healthy thing. And so if we start to understand, yeah, karma is from our past causes, we've created conditions within ourselves and our experience and our conditioning to even, you know, enjoy this kind of ice cream or enjoy that kind of uh, health food or uh, find those, these particular kind of people interesting, those kinds of people attractive or not attractive. All that's through our lens of karma. Those people are not, you know, attractive or not attractive. Again, different people will experience them differently. But as I change my karma, my body can change, my taste can change, my experience of others can change. And uh, because karma is always going to result in pleasurable, unpleasurable, or neutral. So 
as I change this, uh, I find some things that were unpleasant more pleasant, or some things that were pleasant not so pleasant. And it's all an inside job. And Roxanne. Hi. Um, earlier, you were saying, instead of focusing on attachment and aversion, focus on or cultivate contentment. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned gratitude and appreciation, but uh, there's a word I'm missing. Contentment had to do with attachment. And what was it for aversion? No, uh, appreciation. Um I mean, had to do with attachment, the opposite. Right. right. And the okay. opposite of aversion was acceptance. Oh, okay. Super. Thanks so much. And contentment is you know, slightly different than gratitude. You know, contentment is a real sense of, of contentedness. Of, uh, uh, you know, gratitude is a, is a sort of a real deep appreciation of a particular thing. I'm very grateful for something. Contentment is a sort of serene stable way of being you know i have enough and uh uh it's it's such a wonderful practice to uh cultivate contentment as opposed to desire you know and uh yeah i mean we have so much you know we have so much as chris pointed out uh, we have so much, we have so much. And, and the more we get, the more suffering we can have. Yeah. The fascinating yeah. thing, Chris, are you going to say something? Uh, yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm new Chris. Hey, um, hey new Chris. <laughs> nice to meet you. You guys are old. I've been listening to the podcast though. And then, uh, while I'm cutting my grass. I know like half the people here just from, uh, from, uh, from the podcast uh, series that, you know, it's been going on, I guess, for a few years. But, uh, hey, John, John, you mentioned earlier, you were talking, you were talking about uh, the annoying people. And I was thinking back, I had something at work today, you know, so I was really relating to that. And you were mentioning you were given the task or like an assignment early on to like be around annoying people or to surround yourself with that. And was that like a monastic, like a monastic training? And then is that a way that you that's sort of part A of the question. Does is that sort of like a training that you were given? And then did that help to change your karma, like learning to like Brussels sprouts when you don't like Brussels sprouts? Uh, if you learn really cool ways to make Brussels sprouts and roast them and stuff, you end up maybe liking them. Yeah, so the uh, the training was within the realm of Buddhism. It wasn't when I was a monk, but when I was learning training the mind and, and mind training intention. So I studied for quite a bit before I you know, became a monk. And so, yeah, the assignment was uh, to spend a great, you know, as much time as possible around people you find annoying. And uh, and so then people got nervous when I wanted to hang around them. Uh, and uh, so I didn't tell them. So, uh, and then and then the, the experience was, you know, start wondering where the annoying is, you know, and you know, what I found was, yeah, it was really all my judgment and all my, my thing around that. And the second part of the question, um, yeah, around Brussels sprouts or anything, what, what we notice is if we start working on virtue, well, the result of virtue is pleasure. So um, technically the reason I would like Brussels sprouts is because I've done a lot of virtuous things in my life and I have a lot more pleasure. Matter of fact, most foods I enjoy, it's uh, very fortunate. I don't know if it's really because the karma, because I was a good person or the fact I can't smell because my nose has been so damaged. I don't have really subtle taste. So I, I don't have a fine tuned, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, ability to distinguish very good taste, but, uh, but I still love Brussels sprouts. Uh, so, but as our karma changes, uh, it's not that we need to gradually find ways to like Brussels sprouts. So that's a good thing to do because Brussels sprouts are good for you. And there's lots of recipes and lots of ways to cook them. Don't even get me started. Uh, so it, it's not like I'm purposely trying to accomplish that thing. It's much more of as I cultivate virtue, as I engage in the world with um, ways that are more compassionate and kind and uh, create, you know, this uh, more good karma, then you're going to find that 
things that used to bug you don't bug you anymore. Uh, things that used to be, you know, unpleasant aren't so unpleasant anymore. And uh, and your experience of them changes. That's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll check out virtue between now and next time. And, you know, and then like, because I know there's probably Buddhist lists around virtue, I'm sure. Well, yeah, 10, there's 10 non-virtuous actions uh, to avoid. Avoid the 10 non-virtues. Do the 10 virtues and on our community app, you'll find it in good list. Uh, okay. Thank you, John. Appreciate yeah. that. Top 10 list. Okay. And I just wanted to comment on the uh, annoying part of it because I've always found that anecdote of yours really interesting. You've uh, in the past used a different example in terms of like you think somebody's a jerk. Are they a jerk all the time or are they a jerk in that moment? It's just, yeah, I've always found that really interesting. And I used to, get wrapped up in that quite a bit. And I've always been very grateful to come across that teaching. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, the problem is once we stick the label on someone as jerk or annoying, every time they're around us, guess what? <laughs> Even if they're not doing anything jerky or annoying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, well, we went a little long. So uh, so we'll pick up and we'll kind of look at how we start working with these afflictions. But I think, you know, this uh, main thing that I was hoping we all get out is, is they're not who you are. They're just not who you are. And they're not permanent in any way. And, uh, and they're very helpful to have us uh, discover the things that we can work on to improve our lives. You know, see them as helpful in that way. I think it's a good approach. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll look up that karma and klesha thing, Carly. See if I can give me a better answer. Uh, give me something to do. And now let's go ahead and get ready to dedicate. Uh, taking just a moment to recognize that we've cultivated a great deal of merits from our time together, I'd like to dedicate this for the benefit of all sentient beings. May they find the conditions to ripen their lives to be free of suffering and for our own continued spiritual growth. And we may engage with these teachings in ways that help us eliminate delusion and recognize our own Buddha nature so it can be of greatest benefit to all. And for those who care to, you can join me in the dedication prayer. By this merit, may I soon attain the enlightened state of Guru Buddha, that I may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their sufferings. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. All right. Well, such a joy to spend the evening with you. Uh, real honor. So I do hope you all take good care of yourselves and uh, really give yourselves the opportunity to be gentle with who you are and how you're showing up so that we can work on those afflictions properly. All right. Be well. Oh. Um.